Hello to all of our YouTube subscribers and viewers. Today marks the 50th episode of If This Car Could Talk. Without the support of viewers and also the folks that have graciously let us feature their cars, we would not have this channel, so we send a thank you to all of them. Today we're doing something a bit unusual, but we guarantee you'll find it interesting. Every car we featured so far has an interesting story. So imagine what any car could say if it could really talk. Well, slot cars are no different. Recently, we were told about a slot car track that was opened by an enthusiast who thought that he, and many others like him, needed a place to go race, buy parts, and to help modify their cars. You know, pretty much the same things we full-size car guys do, only on a much smaller scale. We spent a Saturday afternoon at Keith's shop and can see that this is an addictive hobby. We also saw the camaraderie between racers and how easily and inexpensively someone can enter the hobby. Of course, some of the more seasoned slot car folks have a lot more cars and they're always tweaking them to run better on different tracks. So let's go for a ride. Good afternoon, my name is Keith. I'm the owner of Total Control Slot Car Racing here in Phoenix. And what we do is we have slot car racing. We also have a pit stop in the back of the store where you can come in and refresh yourself with a nice smoothie or a coffee or tea. We try to keep everything healthy in here and we want the racer to have the best experience they can have. What I do is, I mean, I've been in slot cars for over 50 years actually as long since I was about five years old my father would play around he had a setup in the house back in upstate New York and him and his father would get together and play along and race each other and they had a couple men from the fire department that would come up and race with them so I was experiencing that for most of my young life I wanted to get back into slot cars and I played with HO over the years I've also played with 124th and 132nd scale I used to race over on one of uh, the local racetracks here in Phoenix and decided that since there was only one existing track here in the valley that was running competitions, I wanted to open a store. So August 1st of 2019, I opened Total Control Slot Car Racing and Dragon Nutrition and I've been slowly building the business ever since. We actually come out here and we race 132nd scale racing and I mainly race Carrera and Scalectric. I've got two tracks here. One's over 80 feet long, the other one's about 55 feet long. It gives you a great experience. I even have a small HO track if you want to check that out. We do one of the classes that, being that I like old cars and a lot of other people in the valley do, we do a Trans Am Classic. So it's any car that used to be run from 1962 to 72. And there's some more current Trans Am classics that are out there, but you know, we're trying to run more nostalgia. And that's what I would like to get in. I want to get some leagues going to where we can look at coming in once a week or once or, or bi weekly and racing against your friends and go through a one or two month competition. In the one in the one thirty second scale, uh, when we're running a hundred percent power on there with a, a car that's running, let's say uh, a 21,000 RPM motor in there they're getting scale speeds of on the track we're getting about 6.4 seconds per lap and that equates to about 320 miles an hour scale uh, there's a local um, HO builder that does custom um, custom car tops and I've talked to him and we're looking at getting those in here for the customers but the retail aspect of this I've got over $40,000 in inventory I've got the best inventory in Arizona. I don't just get the cars in for Christmas. I get the cars in every couple of weeks. If something new comes out, I try to get it in the store as soon as possible. If I don't have it, 
I'll do my best to locate it. I'm a business and I want to be around here for many, many years. I don't want to be another dinosaur that's going extinct. I don't want to see this hobby going extinct. So the more people that we get to support it and come in, the better. And I will never lie to you about a product. I will give you the straight up. If I think you can get into a track less affordable, I'll give you that option. And I'll give you the regular option. There's sometimes that you might want all the bells and whistles. There's sometimes that you may want all the bells and whistles on a budget. We can do that too. But we're open four days a week right now. We're open Thursday, Friday from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. Saturday and Sunday, we're open 12 noon to 6 p.m. And of course, if you have a group of six people or more, I'll open any day of the week, any hour of the day. I like having special parties at 10 o'clock at night, come in for about four hours and have a blast. You don't have to worry about the COVID. Everything's wiped down. We wear masks if needed. If I don't know you, I'm definitely wearing a mask and I want you to be safe as well. So that's what I do. Come down, I'll show you how to modify your cars. We're trying and working toward getting a wood race track here in the store in uh, 2021 and look forward to that. And I'm hoping you're going to have a great Christmas season because come down, race. I've got some special offers and some special deals going on for you. I'd love to see you. And me and my wife are both here. She does the drinks. I do the racing. So I hope to see you soon. The first commercial slot cars were made by Lionel, most famous for their model trains and associated ephemera. They first appeared in their catalogs in 1912. They were surprisingly similar to modern slot cars, powered by drawing household electrical energy from a toy train rail sunk into a wide slot between the rails. Independent speed control was also available as an extra option. Production was discontinued after 1915. Sporadically over the next 40 years, several other electrically powered hobby products came and went. Although a patent was registered as far back as March of 1936 for a slot car, until the late 1950s, nearly all electrically powered toy vehicles were guided by raised rails either at the wheels, at the lane center, or the edge. By the late 1930s, serious hobbyists were racing relatively large 1 16th to 1 18th scale model cars, powered by small internal combustion engines. Construction of these model cars really required craftsmanship and skills beyond most amateur hobbyists. For guidance, the cars were clamped to a single center rail or tethered from the center of a circular track. Then they were started and let go for timed runs. There was no driver control of either the speed or the steering, so gas car racing was largely a mechanics hobby. In 1954, the Southport Model Engineering Society in the UK was challenged by a patent holder for using rail-guided gas car exhibitions. It was a groundbreaking six-lane layout nearly 60 feet long for 132nd rail guided cars, which is widely considered to be the basis of electric slot car racing. Soon after, several clubs in the UK and the US, inspired by the Southport layout, were also racing electric cars guided by center rails, and soon evolved into slots in the track surface. The term slot car was coined to differentiate them from the earlier rail cars. The relative advantages of rail and slot were debated for several years, but the obtrusive appearance of the rails and their blocking of the car's rear wheels when sliding through corners were powerful disadvantages. Hobbyists were increasingly choosing the slot system. By 1963, even the hardcore rail racing club members began switching to slots. In about 1957, Scalectric's slot car models in approximately 1 30th scale were electrified versions of Scalex clockwork cars and are among the first commercially available slot cars of the modern era. Victory Industries, competing directly with Scalectrics, introduced their new VIP line. Both companies eventually began using new plastic modeling technologies to provide controllable slot racers with authentically scaled and recognizable bodies in the standard 132nd scale 
for the mass market. Both lines included versatile sectional track for the home racer that came in short sections that could easily be assembled into any configuration imaginable. Many hobbyists accurately replicated their favorite tracks from around the world. As scale electrics became an instant hit, American hobbyists and manufacturers were adapting 124th scale commonly seen car models for slot car use. At the same time, an engineer known as Derek Brand developed a tiny electric vibrating motor small enough to power model cars roughly in scale with the HO electric trains. In 1959, Aurora Plastics Corporation released HO vibrator sets with huge success in the US. These tiny cars fascinated the public and their cost and space requirements were better suited to the average consumer than larger scale cars. Within a short time, Scale Electric's 132nd scale cars and Aurora's model motoring HO line had unofficially set off the slot car craze of the 1960s. This craze was largely a U.S. phenomenon and was dominated mostly by HO scale cars. In 1963, after a million and a half cars were produced, Aurora finally replaced the trouble-prone vibrator cars with an innovative flat commutator motor, also created by Brand. Aurora completely dominated the HO market for almost a decade, until challenged by the Tyco cars in the early 1970s. By the late 1970s, the slot car boom was well over. The model train tie-ins and miniature motoring concepts largely forgotten, and the market returned to the more serious racing hobbyist, with local and national racing organizations evolving to set standards and rules for different classes of competition. Technological innovations began bringing much higher speeds in all scales, with faster motors, better tires, and traction magnets to hold the cars down in curves. Though some of the 1960s enthusiasts thought that slot car racing had become too specialized for the casual hobbyist, and they fondly remembered the more primitive cars of their youth as not so fast, but still fun. The hobby was largely dormant during the next two decades for all but the most serious hobbyists. In the 1990s, computer-aided design and methods of 3D printing helped create much more detailed and authentic models than the simple shapes and rudimentary graphics of the earlier slot car boom. Many of the famous race cars from around the world were produced after licensing agreements with the actual manufacturers were reached, allowing hobbyists to own and race the cars of their dreams. In 2004, the digital command control systems, which had revolutionized model railroading in the 1990s, began to appear in 132nd scale slot cars, offering the ability to race multiple cars per lane with more realistic passing. In 2012, Hong Kong Chinese inventor Mac Wing Kuang introduced the Dynamic Motion Express slot car system. The DMX track had a series of parallel slots, allowing drivers to choose lanes on the inside, middle, or outside of the raceway, passing or blocking other racers. DMX slot cars have a rotating mechanism underneath each car with four pins that retract and protrude as the driver commands the car to move left or right. The car disengages its pin with one lane slot, moves to one side or the other, and reinserts the pin in the new lanes slot. These actions are all controlled with an easily installed computer chip, which enables multiple cars to run in the same lane and to change lanes at certain points on the course. Digitally controlled signals sent along the power strips allow each car to respond only to its driver's controller. Commercial tracks like Total Control Slot Car Racing help the hobby by introducing new people, holding organized races with classes and eliminations, and selling all sorts of cars, supplies, track sections, parts, and more. It's important that we as hobbyists support businesses like this to ensure they'll be around for a long time. Racing is a lot of fun, there are strategies involved, the camaraderie is inspiring, 
and constantly tuning your car to run faster is a big part of it. It's exactly what the full-size car enthusiasts do as well. Look up a local track in your area and go check it out. Yes, if these cars could talk, they'd tell you what a thrill it is to run around a track at an adjusted 300 plus miles per hour. There are a lot of different cars available and Keith can even update your older slot cars to run digitally. There are also many different classes to run a car in, prompting a lot of people to bring six or more cars to the track. It's a great way to spend a few hours enjoying cars that very few of us could ever own in real life. But these are still cars we love and can actually race. If you're in the Phoenix area, either as a resident or a visitor, stop on by Total Control Slot Cars. Check out Keith's website for the hours of operation and other info. Remember, he can also help you find rare or discontinued cars, can make any repairs or upgrades, and can also make recommendations for setting up a home track. You still have time to get your favorite car person a slot car for Christmas. When you see Keith, tell him that we at If This Car Could Talk sent you. Join us next Thursday as we recap the amazing final event of the season that Good Guys Hot Rod Association does every year in Scottsdale, Arizona. We were out there with cameras in hand last month and will bring you many of the amazing cars and trucks we saw and many of the trophy winners. Don't miss it. If you like the slot car feature, please give it a thumbs up, share it, and consider subscribing to our channel so you don't miss any of our twice weekly videos. Also, leave a comment and tell us about your slot car memories as a kid, or what car you'd like to get if you're new to the hobby. Until next time, remember, please be careful out there.